I thank you all for coming tonight. It's good to be here. You know, I always take it really, really seriously when I'm, I'm asked to come, and I really think it would be a, a, a great honor. And I always look forward to, to standing up here and, and speaking to you. I wasn't expecting to be speaking to you tonight. Um, I was sitting at home on Thursday evening, minding my own business, working on my Sunday school lesson for this Sunday, and a text came in, and it was my dad, and he says that the, the, the preacher who was slated for this evening, he had an emergency come up, and um, he needed somebody to preach. So uh, what do you say? I said, okay. And I talked I, I talk to him on the telephone um, this afternoon, and I said, well, what happened? And he shared with me how Cesar had had a, an emergency and he had had to um, leave out of town. And he said, um, I called this pastor, and he said, I called that pastor, and the pastor from this church and that church, and I left a message with so-and-so from the congregation. He said, but I couldn't get anyone else to, to, to come and to bring the message. So I was flattered that um, I was the last pick. <laughs> but hey, it's, it's good to be here tonight. And you know what? I, I do take it seriously. And you know what? God knew. God knew. He knew exactly what was going to happen. And, and I was just the man for tonight. So I'm going to give you what I got. And it's in the book of Luke. It's chapter 2. And it starts in verse 8. And here's how it reads. Luke chapter 2. Starts in verse 8. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone about them. They were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You'll find a baby wrapped in cloths and laying in a manger. And suddenly, a great company of heavenly hosts appeared with, angel, with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to men on whom His favor rests. When the angel had left them, and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for today. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to be in your house, Lord, and to be with good, kind brothers and sisters. We thank you, Lord, for our Sunday school classes. Thank you for our teachers, Lord. And Lord, we thank you for the people that you bring to the classes each Sunday. Lord, I thank you for this group. And Lord, I thank you for bringing them out tonight. And Lord, I pray that as we learned this morning, Father, that as your seed is, is, is sown or broadcasted, Lord, that it would find some good ground and it would bear root. Be with me tonight, Lord. Help me as I bring your word. Give me confidence, Father, in you. And be with those who are listening. I pray, Lord, that if there's someone here who hasn't yet trusted you as Savior, Lord, that you might use this word tonight to be a blessing to them. Thank you for all these things, Father. And it's in your Son's name that we pray. Amen. You know, Christmas is a, is a really great time of the year. And it's really nice to have our trees up here and, and the wreaths that are, that are all um, lit up. It's a, it's a great time of the year, and, and we really enjoy it over at our house. And we've already had our trip to Christmas Tree Lane out in Ceres. And uh, it was great just to walk through the neighborhood, Christmas Tree Lane, to be with other people and to get to take a look at the lights. And we, we really enjoy it. You know, Christmas, it's a great time of the year. It's a time when things, they, they seem to be just a little bit different. People are more friendly. They seem to be a bit more cheerful. And that guy who maybe lives next door, who never usually waves at you or gives you a smile, Christmas is maybe the one time of the year that you may catch his eye and he may crack a smile 
and, and give you a wave and maybe even wish you Merry Christmas. And you know, I don't know if any of you work at the workplace. Um, I know Ryan does. Now, many of you are retired, but, you know, at, at, at my workplace, it's, it's a really special time of the year because it's a, a much happier place to work. When we go back to work tomorrow, everyone's going to be anticipating our Christmas potluck that's going to be on Thursday. We're going to have our party and we're going to have a feast um, all together and everybody's fingers are crossed that management's going to pass everyone out a nice Christmas bonus that we can enjoy. We're looking forward to having a few days off to spend with with our families and and to put our feet up. But you know, for kids, for children, it's an especially exciting time. It's an especially exciting time because if your kids or grandkids are, are anything like mine, they've got high hopes that Santa is going to stop by our house and that he's going to leave them that thing that they have wanted for the whole year. And I wonder, do you remember the excitement that you had on Christmas Eve when you were a little boy or, or when you were a little girl? I remember that excitement. And uh, I remember I was probably my son's age, Colin, and I was probably eight years old. And, and I remember it was Christmas Eve night. And I remember laying in bed and I shared a room with my brother. And at the time, our bedroom faced the street in England. And I remember he gave me a shake late in the night. And he was older than me. He probably would have been about 14 at the time. But he shook me and he woke me up, woke me up from my sleep. And he brought me over to the window and he stretched out his arm and he extended his finger out into the dark Christmas night. And he said, there he is. And I looked out into the cold Christmas night and I, I desperately said, where? And as he described the um, lights that, that he's seen um, going through the sky, he, he, he described them so vividly. And it was as if I could see them myself. It was Santa. And you know, Santa, he's, he's a great guy and he's a really popular time around this time of the year. You'll see him on wrapping paper. You'll notice him up on rooftops. You'll see him in front yards in, 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 in blow-up um, toys. You'll even be able to go and, and speak to him if you go and you visit um, the mall. But as I looked at this passage, I thought about that. And I thought about Mr. Claus. And I thought about Jesus Christ. And I thought about something that I brought to my class last year. Because, you know, without being rude or, 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 or crude or, or without at all trying to mock, I want you to know that there are many similarities between Santa and Jesus. Santa has a white beard. In Revelation 1.14, Jesus Christ, too, has white hair like wool. Sorry, Santa has a beard. And I, I, Isaiah 56, God has a beard. Santa's arrival is always a mystery. You never know when he's going to show up. You've got to be asleep. And uh, the same when Jesus Christ returns. Nobody knows the, the hour. Santa is a carpenter of toys. Jesus Christ, when he was here on earth, he was a carpenter as well. Santa has this great power to deliver, to deliver all of these gifts to all the children in one night. Jesus Christ is all-powerful. Santa knows if you've been bad or good. God is all-knowing as well. Santa, he lives forever. We were talking to Colin this afternoon, and he was, he was talking to us, and he had learned that, that Jesus was eternal. And that's the way it is with, with God. He's, he's eternal. Santa said to live in the hearts of children, Jesus Christ is said to live in the hearts of men. And Santa, of course, brings children gifts. And we know that every good and perfect gift, it comes from God. Santa encourages us to obey our parents. God's word commands us to obey our parents. I know if you go to the mall, like my two kids did yesterday, 
Santa tells the kids to come to him. And they go and they sit on his lap. Jesus Christ, when he was here, he bid the little children to, to come on to me, is what he said. Perhaps interesting of all, Chris Kringle. The name Chris Kringle, it actually means Christ child. And we know the Lord was the Christ child. And there are many other similarities as well. Something you might look up when you get home. But there's one thing. One thing that sets Jesus Christ apart. There's many things, but one thing in particular. And that is that Santa doesn't come to everybody. Santa only comes to boys and girls who have been good all year round. Haven't you heard that? Maybe when your kids were beginning to act up around this time of the year, you would, you would remind them that. And you'd say, remember, you know, keep acting like that. Scent is not going to, he's not going to come and he's not going to bring you any gifts. You know, what a terrible thing for a child. For their name to end up on the naughty list on Christmas Eve. Terrible thought. To make it to the, to, the, to the naughty list. And I wonder when you were a little boy or girl, I wonder, were you naughty or nice? I wonder this year, were you naughty or nice? And I wonder, maybe you're like me and you think to yourself, you know what, if Santa did come to grown-ups, I don't know if there'd be any presents that would be delivered for me. Yes, Santa only comes to good boys and girls, but the good news for us tonight is that this passage tells us that Jesus Christ, in verse 10, He came for all the people. The Bible says that He came to seek and save the lost. To make it more personal, in verse 11, it says, Christ is born to you. To be a little bit more plain, He came for bad men and for bad women like us. And that's the difference for us tonight. And in the book of Luke, chapter 2, verse 8, that we, that we looked at um, tonight, we see just yet that. Yes, these, these folks they, that we read about in the passage, the first invitation goes out to welcome in God into the world. The first invitation goes out to welcome in the King of kings and the Lord of lords. It goes out into the world. And notice who it goes out to in verse 8. Ryan, it goes out to the shepherds, not to priests, but to shepherds, not to Pharisees, but to shepherds, not to kings, but to shepherds, not to rulers of the world, but to shepherds, not to princes, but to shepherds. And these shepherds, they were a very unlikely group of people. They were working men. These shepherds, they were rough. They were tough. They were crude. They were despised by the people around them. They were men who had all kinds of dirty little stories connected um, to them. You know, it looks really nice in the, in the Christmas play. It'll look really nice when the school does their thing this week and, and the shepherds get up and there's the little guy with his nice um, headdress on and his, and his long tunic and they look so cute. It all looks really, really nice. And there's the little guy holding his staff in one hand and, and a fuzzy little lamb underneath his arm and, and, and he's petting him. And, and as we look up at the Christmas play, you think to yourself, there wouldn't be a more deserving group of people to be invited to the birth of a king. The truth is, that could not be further from the truth. Because these guys, likely, they didn't even own the sheep that they were, that they were watching. Most likely, they weren't the owners. They were, they, they were probably what Jesus Christ describes in John chapter 10 as the hired hands. Their owners were, were likely in bed. They were hired hands. They were men who were barely making a living. They were men who probably had no home of their own. They were men who probably had no families to go home to. They were lonely men. They were uneducated men. They were men who lived on the outskirts, on the fringe of society. They had a bad reputation. Look back at John 10 when you get home. They had a bad reputation of dishonesty. 
And you know, you couldn't buy milk or wool from a shepherd because it was just taken for granted that if they were selling it, it was probably stolen. A shepherd couldn't hold office. He couldn't testify in court because they were known liars. These men were not looked up to, but they were looked down on. They were looked down on by the religious people of the day. They were looked down on by the orthodox people of the day. And if a shepherd came into your neighborhood, it was time to roll up the windows. It was time to bring in the bicycles and make sure they're, ch they're chained up because it was likely if a shepherd was coming into your neighborhood that he was looking for trouble. These men weren't known for bravery. They weren't known for courage, but for thievery and for lies. And they certainly weren't noted for their deep insight on God or in God's word. You see, God just wasn't part of their life. He just wasn't in their thought process. They were busy doing their work. They had a lot going on. They were caught up in life. They were caught up in their own lives. The truth is, they're a lot like men and women today. But on this particular night, something was about to happen. You see, these shepherds, they were out, James, and they were doing what they did. Doing what they did, they were watching, their, watching the sheep. They had probably done this hundreds of nights um, before. And it was nighttime. And I can just imagine them setting up their camp. And Doyle, they were probably laying out their, their blanket and, and getting ready to, to curl up and, and, to, and, to, and to get some um, rest. But on that night, it would be anything but normal for these shepherds. Because when we read in verse 9, there they were. They were laying down, getting ready to, to go to sleep, out looking at the night side, just getting ready to close their eyes. And boom! Just like that. In verse 9, an angel of the Lord appeared and the glory of the Lord shone about them. And just like that, God had broken in to their thought process. Just like that, God had penetrated their world. He had broken into their normal routine of life. He had burst into their lives like a, like a, like a bull that was, that was charging out of, a, out of a pen. And Jesus Christ, God, had become real to them. They had no time for God. But thank God that God took time for those shepherds. Suddenly, they were forced to face God. They were forced to face Him and to face His heavenly messenger. You know, God has a way of doing that, doesn't He? He's got a way of, of, of forcing His way into our lives, of elbowing through all the busyness, through all the garbage, and through all the mess and clutter of our lives. And He has the ability to, to get through to us like nobody else can. He doesn't ask permission but he shows up. He doesn't ask for an invite, but he shows up. He forces us to face him. And I wonder, is there anyone here tonight? And you know about that. Maybe you've been just minding your own biz. Maybe you've been uh, minding your, your business, working your job, living your life. Suddenly God grabs hold of you. Maybe it's through an illness. You get an illness and, and suddenly your, your health is on the line. And you, you look to God for help. Maybe it was in the, the death of a family member and all of a sudden your mind is faced, is forced rather, to face and to think of eternity and eternal things. Maybe your next door neighbor invited you to church. Maybe you're sitting in service and... Man, you, the preacher preaches and, and it seems like he's always looking at you. It seems like the things that he says, they're, they're words to you. It's never happened to you before. You can't get God off your mind. But God does this. Why does he do this? He does this in order to get our attention. He wants to get our, our attention. He wants us to, to listen up. And this is exactly what's going on in Luke chapter 2. That's what's going on with our friends in the book of Luke chapter 2. God was going to force them to listen. Well, how did they feel when, when God did that? Verse 9 tells us, it says they were terrified. 
terrified. You'd be terrified too, Manny, if that happened to you. I would be as well. They didn't say, hey, we're trying to get some sleep. Come back another time when we wake up. They didn't say, okie dokie, thanks for the heads up. They didn't say, hey, sorry, you got the wrong one. Don't you know we don't go to church? It says they were terrified. Why were they terrified? Look at verse 9. The glory of the Lord or the presence of the Lord was about them. It's like Ryan talked about this morning. They were terrified because they knew who God was and they knew who they were. As one commentator has said, they had a, a good awareness of God and a, and a good view of, of themselves. They knew God was perfect. They knew they weren't perfect. And I bet that they were thinking, why is this angel showed up? And I'm sure I put myself in their shoes and there's probably 101 different sins that are going through their mind. And they're probably thinking, be sure your sins will find you out. He's here now. I'm going to have to answer to him now. It's all over. What's he going to do to me? And you know what? The shepherds, they were uncomfortable. And just as the shepherds felt this way, so the same is when God penetrates into our world. And when he inserts himself into our lives, it makes us uncomfortable because the more we find out about God, like Ryan said this morning, the more we find out about ourselves. And the more we see how holy God is, the more we see how filthy we are. And the more we see how perfect he is and how he can't be around sin, the more we realize that we are sinners. We're liars. We're cheats. We're thieves. We have bad thoughts. It makes us uncomfortable. Several years ago, my wife was impressed to call up her step-grandmother, who had, she had not seen since my wife was a little girl. She got her number. She was concerned for her soul. She wanted to invite her to the church service. She called her up, and they had a good chat on the telephone. And a good time catching up. And my wife got to invite her to service and got to share a word for the Lord. She thought they had a great chat. Some days later, that old lady, she called another family member. She was terrified. She was terrified that Ashley had called her up and she needed to know why she had called her and why she had invited her to church. There's no doubt in my mind that God was working in that old woman. And she had entertained an angel, a messenger of God, unaware. It's happened to me. It happened to me about six months ago. A lady at work, really nice lady, works on the production floor, a friend of mine. She always knew that I went to church. I never mentioned the name Jesus. She got sick. She went into the hospital. Had a problem in her brain, a brain tumor. She was in the hospital for at least a week, and she came back. I knew I had to say something. I was worried about her, and I knew she wasn't a Christian. And I asked her if I could pray with her. She said yes. And I prayed with her, and at that time, we were going through a course here at the church called Sharing Jesus Without Fear. And we had learned some techniques on sharing your faith, and, and I had some passages that I had asked her to read. And she read them. And uh, our study that we did always encourages you to get the person to read and then ask them what it says to them. We did that. She went home. And the next day, she came back to work. And uh, she told me that she had been scared after we had talked. She told me she had been scared because she thought that she was going to die. Sometimes God makes us uncomfortable when he's working in our lives. And I wonder, could be, there's somebody here tonight and God has made his way to your life. And things that you, you hear or read it didn't make sense to you last year or, or last month. But all of a sudden, God's word is beginning to make sense. You believe in God and you believe in his son, Jesus Christ. You believe in heaven, and you even believe in hell. 
but you know that you're not living the life that God has you to live. Maybe everybody else thinks you are, but you know better. And in your heart, you know that you're not a Christian. And that thing's been troubling you. And at times, you've been like these shepherds. You've been terrified. That's a good place to be. And thank God that you're there if that's the case. And thank God that he's brought you back to his house tonight. Because that, my friend, is called conviction of sin. And you can never, 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 ever, ever, ever be saved. Unless first you feel sorrow and conviction of sin. You know, there are people and we'll get in our cars tonight and we'll drive down the road and we'll see them. There's people tonight and they're, they're sitting in their warm homes. No doubt there was people in service this morning. Could even be people sitting in here tonight. And they've never felt conviction of sin. Or at least they have not acknowledged it. And these poor people, these poor people are going 100 miles per hour straight to the fires of hell. And all the time they think that everything with them is A-OK. -okay. But you're privileged because you know better. You know you're not worthy. You know your life's a mess. Well, you're ahead of those other people. But listen, you can't stop there. Because look at verse 11. It says, Today in the town of David, a Savior is born to you. He is Christ the Lord. We need a Savior because we're in too deep. We need a Savior because we're sinners. We need a Savior because we can't save ourselves. We try to, don't we? We try to change this and change that. We try to do this and do that and stop this habit and, and pick up that habit. We, we try it. We try it all. But you see, the truth is, it's not about this or that or changing this or that. The problem's you. The problem's me. The problem is the heart. The shepherds needed a Savior. And so do we. But who is that Savior? The passage tells us in verse 11, it says, He is Christ the Lord. Notice, it's not good works. We know by now it's not just going to church or, or, or saying our prayers. We know it's not Muhammad or Buddha or Rama. We know it's none of those things because the Bible says it's Christ the Lord. The Christ the Messiah, the Anointed One, the Sovereign Prince. In Matthew 1, 21, it says, His name will be Jesus because He will save His people from their sins. He is God. In Acts 4, 12, it says, There's only one name given under heaven whereby we must be saved, and it's the name of Jesus. And this Savior, this Savior had arrived and He had sent out a special invitation to the shepherds on that Christmas Eve night. And tonight, if God has bust into your life and you know your condition and you want a solution, then verse 11 says, today, we could even say tonight. Tonight, a Savior is born to you. And you know what? It's not me and it isn't you and it's not your grandma and it's not your mom. The Savior's not your dad. The Savior's not the preacher. It's not the 49ers. It's not our President Trump. It's not Santa. It's not Rudolph. His name is Jesus. His name is Jesus, born of a virgin. Lived a perfect life for you and for me. Died a terrible death for you and for me. But on the third day, He was raised up from the grave. And tonight... December 10th, 2017, He sits at the right hand of God to make intercession for you and for me. Today, in the town of David, a Savior is born to you. You know, God is sovereign, and He knew what we were going to be talking about tonight. And it could be that you're here, and God has spoken to you through His Word. Well, I would encourage you that before you leave, Grab somebody around you who you know is a Christian. Speak to them. 
and get to the bottom before you leave. Find that Savior, that Savior that has been born to you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your Son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for sending him to earth. We thank you for his life. We thank you for his death. We thank you, Lord, for raising him up on the third day. Thank you, Lord, that even as we pray now, that he's the one that's bringing our prayers to you. And Lord, I pray that if there's somebody here tonight who doesn't know you, Lord, that the seed that's been sown will find good ground. And Lord, that you would use this word. Thank you for your people tonight, Lord. Most, maybe all of them who are Christians. And Lord, I pray that you'll have made this word a blessing and an encouragement to them. Thank you for all these things. In Jesus' name, amen.